play. William, move your head. Look at the size of that boy's head. Shh. I'm not kidding. It's like an orange on a toothpick. Shh, you're going to give the boy a complex. Well, that's a huge noggin. It's a virtual planetoid. Shh. Has its own weather system. Shh. Heat, move. We're here for one reason and one reason only. You know what that is? It starts with a W. To win, Coach Orion, sir. No. <laughs> to work. It's supposed to be anyway. I'm a hobbit. We're a gentle folk from a farming community called the Shire. It's in the northwest corner of Middle Earth. We live a simple life, but we crave adventure. And when we find it, some become heroes. You do not calm down. We will have to restrain you. Uh, are you? I'm leaving. You sure? She's okay. Oh, security! Hell. Oh, God. He's fucking out. We are gentle folk who crave adventure. We are gentle folk who crave adventure. When we find it, we become heroes. I can't be here! Don't stop him! Excuse me, uh, are you need to calm down right now and stop. Screw you! Oh. Oh. Publishing games changed. Hey everybody, it's Jay Mack from Straight Talk. I have the honor of uh, an individual that you've seen around a little bit in movies and TV. Uh, he's been on the uh, Mighty, Di Mighty Ducks trilogy, uh, CSI. Mighty, Bo Mighty Dykes is really great though too. It's really... <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that'll appeal to some it's of you. A, it's a real niche kind of thing you know right maybe they could do a porn film with that yeah. Yeah. yeah that would be uh animated animated porn film this yeah. that that's the real do it right because we have to social distance i love it i love uh, interrupting my own introduction it really is so counterproductive but i'll, I'll shut up now no it's all right but, um you've seen him with al pacino mike Myers, uh, uh george clooney keenan thompson which i just realized was just so young when you first um performed mm -hmm. together and my pleasure is Matt Doherty. So welcome to the show. We're really excited to have this quick chat with you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I feel like we're in each other's homes. Oh, yes, yeah, you pretty uh, much are. <laughs> this is great. You, you so how are you surviving this wonderful pandemic and uh, keeping? Well, the good safe? news is uh, we, uh, Alexandra and I, were we were talking about the fact that the best news is when you do the laundry now, there's less pants. So there's, uh, when you actually do the laundry, it's like you do the thing, you're like, wow, there's a lot, there's just not a lot of like anything under here, you know? So I think that would be the greatest. Um, uh, well, basically nobody's wearing pants. Anymore. Nobody's wearing nobody, pants. Yeah. Nobody. Uh, I, I, that's, that's my, that's my, that's my nonpartisan international response to global pandemic meets uh, uh, causes of social justice, long time coming, should have happened hundreds of years ago moment we're living in that's well, all it is, kind of, it is kind of funny because you see every once in a while someone where they just show the clip of somebody getting up and oh and they get up yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. yeah i remember i i have a friend of mine who's uh who's uh his his wife is uh she's a local newscaster and i think we all kind of knew when things were getting real when when she started doing the news from home <laughs> and I was like okay all right this is uh this is legit. yeah yeah, actually, I was uh, I was talking to Carl Schmidt um, uh, a month ago, and uh, he did an interview with us as well. And he was actually talking about the change of working from home. And um, he's uh, LA uh, ABC LA News. So yeah. So he, uh, what did he say? Oh, he was just talking about how it's all changed and how he's working from home, and it's it's a very strange and and uh, not doing it that way. So. Yeah, I mean, I. Um... Fortunately, I don't need a lot of like social blah, blah, blah. You know, I, um, I kind of, uh, what we've, what we've loved to do is like, um, get camp chairs and, and go out to the park. It's funny how like simple, simple little things that should be part of like my regular diet of life, you know, just for some reason weren't because of, you know, maybe the ways that we were choosing to live before we kind of woke up, right? Um, became so much more important, like little things. Uh, and then like, I can't, I can't imagine anybody living through this moment without having that, like, hey, do I really like, 
do I really want to do that? Do I really need that? Do I, does that, wow, I had spent so much energy on that. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think that like the optimist of me is looking at these incredibly painful times and going, you know, what, um, what can I glean from this that is, uh, you know, how do I define what is essential to me? You know, I think, uh, so that, that's, that's how, you know, when I look at in that point of view, I, I, I haven't had too many bad days and amid all this, I think everybody's had moments um, of like uh, terror or despair and myself included. And um, uh, either personally, like, how am I going to, will there be a thing for me in my own profession after all this? And, or if it's a bigger deal, um, I think anyone has had moments like that, but I, you know, uh, I feel like if I could just concentrate on like what, what can I, what can I do to like hopefully carry forward out of this? Like what, uh, I think we're changed. I think we've all been changed by it. Well, and I also think people realize how important relationships are. And, like, oh man. Yeah. All those things are like work is not so important anymore. Like yeah. you know, family's more important. So I think people are kind of starting to realize that. And I, I think it's a good thing. And also it's amazing to me is how many people, realize how many uh, people can work from home you know <laughs> that you don't need to go to an office Twitter was yeah. a prime example like forget it we're not going to have an office anymore this is crazy why would we have an office you know, it all work from home I think, I think there'll be some good changes uh, what they are I don't know it's kind of a wait and see kind of thing for yeah it, it's a as I say it's a fluid and dynamic and ever-evolving situation <laughs> yeah that's for sure um, let's talk about your career. You you started out very young, um, and you started out in a field that is uh, not the most um, easiest to get into. No. Let's say. Um, I did hear that you did not know how to skate, though, when you first... Uh, it was a, yeah, it was an utter fabrication. Yeah, I... Uh, <laughs> and shocking no one, we all lied. I think there was one kid that knew how to play. Uh, even Josh, who was from Canada, right? He's from Vancouver area uh like he could barely skate so like um yeah we all lied uh to get the job because that's the first thing they teach you uh and i can't even say they teach you that in hacking school i just did this intrinsically as, as a kid you know uh which has gotten me into trouble several times as an actor but um like i think i learned to ride a horse on a horse over a bridge for like a local like state park commercial in illinois where like I literally I was like oh yeah I know how to ride a horse and then I'm like on this like narrow bridge over this gorge, uh, where there's a waterfall and I'm that's where I learned and and had had to pretend like I knew what I was doing, so uh, I mean because that's what you're supposed to do you know you know there's a you got an opportunity it's it's so competitive you just lie and figure it out as you go along, <laughs> whatever it takes to get the job, <laughs> yeah which is you know there's a whole other school of thought you never but what's oddly weird talk about like a, a deal amongst thieves you know like a, a honor amongst these is then the other principle is you never lie on your resume which is really funny right never lie on your resume right which we can all agree but you gotta lie to get there's a, there's a <laughs> so how do you juggle that so do you, do you still stay in touch with a lot of the uh, actors from from uh, yeah, I see a lot of the uh, a lot of the crew um, because of all the anniversaries that have been going on recently, and uh, the nostalgia movement um, amongst you know our now that our generation is our knees are starting to hurt and 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 you know you get a little fat around your waist and you look you're gonna die soon you're middle aged you, you want to look back at your youth you know so fortunately I was in one of those movies that did that so I. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, um, I, I'll, we'll do things and it'll be like a reason to see everybody. And then, you know, somebody will have a kid, uh, you stay in touch or, um, yeah, I mean, I see a lot of, before we all ended up, uh, sequestered, um, I, yeah, I've seen everybody pretty regularly. Yeah. I didn't even realize that you were, um, in the Mike Myers, I Married an Axe Murderer. Oh yeah. That's a and then, classic. And then when it would actually... When I actually, like, oh yeah, no, no, oh yeah, head. That's what I remember. And it was like, yeah. I mean, that, th th those scenes are iconic, man. I, I, I can't believe I was in that movie. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, uh, the amount of like comedic geniuses that were in that film and and legends. 
and the fact that I got to be in San Francisco and uh, for like three weeks to do that because they just couldn't, you know, it took forever to do those scenes because they split the screen and the technology was new. Yeah. Mike Myers was obviously a really great improviser and had to do things the same way twice, but he couldn't because he was just always riffing. So it was, um, it was, and then we would all start laughing and then these George Lucas industrial light magic people were trying to test. Cause I think they were beta testing technology that was going to be used for like huge films. So it was like, it was a pretty exciting experience. And then to just be in San Francisco and I'm like, I remember my mom and I were there and I was like, and they were paying us and they gave you money to when you weren't working. And I worked like two days a week and then we just walk around town and, Oh man, it was a crazy, wonderful time. Yeah, I still but remember it's, that. Very it's fun. still kind of like when you think about it, it's a huge education for you. Like, oh, man. you get to see all those different places and different things and experience those different things. You yeah. don't have to be in the classroom. Yeah, I had a, I mean, I have a really unique um, point of view on uh, things because, like, uh, at a young age, I had tremendous success. And, um, you know, was driven around. I like to say I was driven around limousines and then I drove the limo, but in that order. So that's like a weird <laughs> perspective of life, you know? Uh, so it's, uh, and not much kind of shocks me. Um, I think if you survive all of that, um, it, you know, makes for a really good life, but being, um, being in those experiences can really eat people up. Yeah, for sure. Well, you've been on a lot of shows. You've been on CSI, you've been on Bones. Like, I, I don't think people realize how many things you've actually done. Like, I, That's I, the joy of being a character actor, man. Yeah, and you're like a hobbit on Grey's Anatomy of all things. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, that was a fun episode, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I, I played a lot of like serial, um, uh, what do you call those, um, procedural shows where I'd end up in a interrogation room and we call it scumbag light. Like uh, one of my hair is long, which is starting to get, I play scumbag light, which is right. like, I did, I did something bad, but I didn't do the thing. Was it really bad? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, was my, that was my wheelhouse, right? <laughs> and then when my hair is short, I'm the computer guy. And those are the, those are the things, so yeah. Yeah, so who's been the, who's one of the favorite actors or the, who's been one of the biggest influences for you that you've worked with? Because I mean, you've worked with a lot. Like, that's a huge list of actors that you've been working with at some point throughout your life. It's a great question. Um, there might be more than one. I mean, well, I'd say like um, from Mighty Ducks, uh, because when you have the experience of being on a set for more than just like a day where you're a mercenary, hmm. uh, you feel a part of this weird circus tribe that just, like I have a buddy who's a, a sound engineer and you know, it's like, we're all just pirates hooking up pirate ships, you know? And but when you're on a thing for an extended period of time, you, you know, everybody, when you go and do these, 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 these gigs on TV or whatnot, if you're lucky enough to get them and you know, 10,000 people apply and it's all clicking and, and maybe 18 people get it seen. I mean, it's insane. The odds are, the odds are crazy. And if you get in that room and, and actually get seen, right. And, but those are the jobs that get you your health care and things like that. Um, but you're only there for like a day, two, three days, right? Um, so you don't really feel anybody. You don't get those, those, uh, those experiences where you're really bonded because you're spending all this time with people. Um, so I think I would go toward those times when I was on Ducks or doing plays. But like on Ducks, for example, which I think was really formative for me as an artist, like I had a couple of people, Katie Irby, who was married to Terry Kinney at the time. And Terry Kinney was artistic director, founding member of the Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago. And Katie uh, was a member, and they were doing um, Streetcar Named Desire with Gary Sinise. And, uh, and she said, hey, do you want to come and go backstage and see everybody? And because and, like, I was from Chicago. And so that was a seminal experience for me because I got to go into the green room, I got to see the thing, I got to feel what was like a value. Like I was like, this is what I want. Fuck this being famous shit. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna be an artist, right? 
Yeah. And, um, and so it was like experiences like that. And then some like old time character actor, David Selby, who had been in like in original Tennessee William plays. Cause then I read this play. I was like, I should read this play and pretend like I'd read it. And this guy had seen me reading uh, Streetcar Named Desire or something. And, and he's like, ah, oh, you know, I was in the uh, original Tennessee Williams play. And, and he was like the old dude in the play. And everybody, all the, all us teenagers were like, fuck this guy, you know? And then he would tell me stories, you know? And, and then Jeffrey Nordling, who's a dear friend of mine today, and, um, and often will read my plays and, um, cause I'm a playwright more to my core. Yeah. And like, uh, the, uh, like he was his, the coach on Ducks 3 and was pivotal in my, being an artist and getting and leaving Hollywood and going to school, getting in Northwestern, which was uh, like huge. Him and Selby and um, uh, I mean, just so many, so many like legends that you wouldn't think, like you can't like name them and go, they're famous. Like, sure, I worked with Al Pacino. He has a weird handshake. Um, uh, and I, my my moment of meeting Al was like I felt like oh man it's got to be hard to be Al because he'll never live up to being Al and everyone you felt this like at the actor studio and we're doing a reading and and he looked and he was just like he was trying he was he was having to read this uh, Strindberg play and he was a little like and we were like man it's got to be really hard to live up to being Al Pacino you know and uh, but like when you have that time with people and they share their stories. Those are the things. There's a, such a long list, man. So those are the ones that I and now I try to do that when I meet people who are whatever, and you introduce them to a book. You like Jack White, who was our coach for Ducks. He taught me that in, in terms of hockey, right? That when he was a young hockey player, like Gordy Howe and all these legends would pull him in and, and make sure he felt welcome and included. And so uh, I've always tried to do that because I've had that experience. If that makes any sense. It does. It does. So is that kind of what le led you into? Because you do um, a writer studio, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I participate in um, uh, a really great playwright group out here in LA, um, and we're thriving. And you know, because there's so many TV writers, and out here there's a lot of great playwrights, right? And um, and a lot of us are, we, you know, maybe we write TV and film, and if we're lucky, we get paid to do that, right? But right. at our core, a lot of us are um, playwrights. So there's a tremendous amount of talent. And um, it's been really awesome to be a part of that group for a few years. And it doesn't make you feel you're alone, you know, because it can be really isolating when you're, like, making work and trying to get people to read it and, and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So is that why you kind of got into your blog around uh, step into my backseat? I think it's called. Yeah, that was when I was driving. When I was driving Lyft, I had where I started. Uh, uh, I drove Lyft for several years, um, and I started a blog with all the experiences of people that were in the backseat. And then it evolved and became a love of LA. And then, um, uh, and then I remember when I turned it into a website. Somebody said, "Hey, dude, you should protect the W uh, because some porn site might want it." <laughs> And I was, and they, so I'm writing this, like these like blogs about people and humanity. And somebody's like, Hey, you know, your blog site might get bought for 20 grand. You should totally get that one <laughs> because it could somehow be construed as being a somewhat pornographic, which I thought was hysterical. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I just did it because the same reason why you write songs, you know, there's, you, you can get that instantaneous finished something and practice. And it's like woodshedding as a musician, you know, cause like, plays and screenplays and all those, those take they take time so doing a blog is a way of like keeping your knife sharp you know mm -hmm. yeah so you you but you're also writing music yeah 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 yeah, yeah. So, i just started i just started playing when i was on sets and movies and and uh and then uh and then i was in a bluegrass band for a while called the middle class we were kind of more of a jug band because we had a washboard and uh um yeah, really, and we're we're back in the studio where we were working on an, a reunion record. We call it. <laughs> it's great because none of us have any aspiration to like, you know, be famous, be rock stars. It's just so cool to do a thing, to do it, and that's just because you like it, right? Oh man, yeah, yeah. So I mean, and I, I just started playing guitar because, um, you know, it kept me company, 
and then uh, became, you know, my guitar has been uh, big. My brother was is a musician, so you know that's how it all started. You know? And pe well, people seem to think like they don't see like all the behind the scenes stuff, right? So they don't know that you like there's a bunch of stuff you got to do, like rehearsing lines and all that other stuff. All they see is you're a star and you're on a show and you get all the glamour. And nobody actually really knows it's a whole bunch of. Stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people out here, right? I mean, I'm sure you know this, right? That are so wonderfully talented or, or in a circus sideshow tent that don't get the media attention or, or um, you know, and it's an artist's life is not an easy life. But uh, it's, um, to me, and I still have to be vigilant with this, right? Uh, when I don't confuse success with my achievements, mm -hmm. then I'm a happier man and I'm usually more productive and, um, you know, because it's, it's not so that the amount of disrespect, the amount of inhumanity, I mean, all those things, they're very well documented. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you know this, but Hollywood's not a very, it's not a meritocracy, you know, it's not a, right. But like, but like when you really cut it down, the work itself is, is like anyone who's really, it's it's got to be enough you know and i remember doing a play with this dude and he was a great huge director and he was just doing us a favor doing his tiny little play we were doing the john patrick shanley play and i was um i was at a low point i had like no money and um uh and i was like i had i had my i was a child actor and then like i was like i guess i gotta get a job right and um and i remember we were doing this play and it was above like a storage unit of like a an indian restaurant where they had the like this is great tiny little theater that they had, they made some great work in until somebody raised the rents and the theater got kicked out that was like this exodus in la right and um the director was one of bobby de niro's dudes like they were tight they grew up together and he directed a few of his films and um we get a call. I'm in rehearsal. I'm like feeling like I hate my life. We get a call. He picks it up and he's giving me notes, right? And he's talking to his friend named Bobby. I have no idea that it's Robert De Niro on the other end of the phone, right? And the guy is jealous of us for how we're working on this play. Just working on it. And he missed it. And how much, and he was in some airport going to Hong Kong to do the thing and he was tired and he missed his wife and and like and he just felt like he hadn't been excited in year whatever the whole whatever the thing was and it just hit me of like oh like oh that that's 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 robert de niro asking about this theater that we're in right i was like holy shit you know that's actually I don't, yeah i was like what do we know man we're never to should be judging our own experience right yeah do you find there's kind of a shift right now and in, in like definitely in community representation, I know there's been a big battle about women in Hollywood and women, um, uh, minorities. Um, like I was just talking to a friend. I was like, it's not a really good time to be a straight white man without a lot of credits, and um, and that's for good reason, you know. I um, it's like we're there's a moment of a reckoning, and like you can see it. You can you feel it like um it's it, it's it's everything like when we wa we were watching um we're here on hbo or is it hbo where like the uh the awesome drag queens go to these tiny little towns and they and they confront like oh yeah systemic yeah. systemic problems right and 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 do it with love and and they're there and and i feel like there's this moment right now where like that's happening with with black lives matter it's happening um individually it's happening in writers rooms like there's a reckoning going on and uh, it's exciting. You know, the, uh, the idea of uh, like, um, you know, not bullshit diversity quotients that executives do to fill a check a box, but like actual change. And I ask myself these, these tough questions. What am I doing as an advocate? What am I doing as an ally? What am I doing to make anyone who's felt unwelcome in their life, whether because they were, they you know liked elephants or they were purple it doesn't matter like what can i do to help 
you know, it's, it's like a weird time. We talk about it all the time. Uh, like, what am I doing to add to this conversation uh, as an artist and as a, you know, what can I do to, to, to help, like, not only hold the door open, but we rip it off its hinges, you know? Yeah, for sure. Is this, so you, you posted a video on your, your uh, website about Ferguson. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah, which is very powerful, by the way. I, I, it kind of reminds me that, you know, the, the systemic racism has been on for a long time. Um, and it just seems that we seem to be at a very pivotal moment all of a sudden. Well, I mean, if you're willing to risk your life with COVID-19, yes, I think that pretty much. Yeah, right. I mean, we, we talked about it. We ran the risk of, are we going to, if we're going to go out there and we got the good masks, you know, is it, and it's like, wow, you must be to see when we went out in March the first time out here recently, um, I felt a tremendous sense of like catharsis, you know, I felt because we'd all been uh, only seeing, you know, this through people, uh, which is great because you're here in Toronto, right? And yeah. We're able to have a moment and actually synchronize and connect and, and like, uh, that's awesome. But like, we haven't been able to be around people and to be out and feel the energy and the healing and, and the grief was uh, really powerful. So your you dignity just hit Spotify. Mm -hmm. like a little a while time ago. Yeah. 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 So tell me a little bit about that. Um, it was just a promise to myself because I hadn't um, I hadn't recorded for a while. I hadn't I had I had been in a rut not finishing things because I was doing these these big projects trying to get things happening and then they kind of would all fizzle out and, and I was like you know what I'm doing something for me I think it was my 40th birthday and I was like um, this is for me I'm gonna be the change I want to see in the world. I'm going to hire people and pay them what I like, you know, like, like I want to pay that clarinet player, um, the hundred bucks or whatever it is to come in for 20 minutes, you know, like, um, I want to be the thing that I want to receive. Right. And, uh, and then I really, uh, I, cause I play a lot of Americana music. And so it was like an effort for me to pay homage to like, all the influences that I have from Dixieland to, to uh, ragtime guitar, to Chicago blues, to um, finger style playing, to, uh, you know, all the things to my Irish roots. And I, and like I, cause I think sometimes folk records, they kind of all end up homogenous, you know? So mm -hmm. I really wanted to feel within my wheelhouse, but like, you know, do that um, and make a real complete record, you know? And, uh, and I'm really proud of it. You know, I, I, I think I had like really bad strep throat too when I finally did vocals. Like I was really sick. Uh, and, but I was like, ah, and you had to let it go. And then it was like, you can have good, cheap and fast, right? So I was trying to have it good, keep it cheap. So then it took forever to like get it, um, to get all the like the dials in, in people's because there are a lot of people who are doing favor prices and friend prices. And so it took, a, it took a while to get it all done. And then... Um, and then I just finished it. And it's really satisfying to finish, finish something and release it into the world, you know, and then just do another one. Yeah, that's very cool. So they can find that on Spotify? Yeah, it's on Spotify, Apple Music, all those things. Um, and it's, you can look it up on, I think there's a link on my web, website, uh, which is mattdoherty.net. Um, you can link it on Spotify. And if you just get a chance to hear a song, you know, listen to, uh, because of what's going on in the world, listen to, Ferguson or listen to the Pete Seeger tune, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, Matt, I know that uh, you've got some other stuff to do, so I don't want to keep too long. I really appreciate you uh, taking some time out to talk to us, and it was great to actually finally connect with you. Um, oh, absolutely. Very, very excited to see all the new things, and hopefully we'll get you back again soon. Oh, I'd love to. You're a great uh, interviewer and a really easy to, to, uh, to converse with. And I would love to hear a little bit more if this is an initiative you've started for yourself and in Toronto to, to bring more, um, uh, yeah. you sparked an idea in my head, so we should probably talk after this. Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate talking, it. Like, sparking things in my head. I was like, well, yeah, we should talk some more. Anyway, I'm going to sign up for a straight talk and, uh, just to, hang on a second. I know. Uh, all right. Thanks everybody for tuning in and we'll, uh, we'll see y'all real soon.